Dr. Laconte, welcome to Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. We're going to ask that if you just make a, a few comments about the one of our founding principles, the principle of knowing classical history, and then we'll go to questions. Kathy, thanks so much for having me on the program. It's terrific to be back with you and also look forward to the conversation with Jordan and Jewel and, and the rest of your audience there. I'm so glad you are taking on this topic because we are in the midst of a real struggle right now, you could argue, uh, in our country and more broadly in the West. Um, what's, what is it about Western civilization that's worth defending? We are having that debate really right now as we speak. Is there anything in Western civilization worth defending? Well, the American founders certainly believed uh, that that was the case. They certainly believed that in that classical tradition, that Greco-Roman tradition, there was a lot there to be mined. There were lessons to be learned. There were concepts to be embraced. And uh, one of the challenges we face, I think, right now, and I'm so glad for the work that you guys are doing at Constituting uh, America, one of the great challenges is this educational task, is helping uh, the next generation to understand, to appreciate this incredible cultural inheritance that we have in that from that classical tradition. And the founders, probably more than any other political generation in history, were attentive to those lessons. They were attentive to the past. So when they studied, for example, uh, the, the story, the democratic story of Greece, the Republican story of Rome, they're looking at that through a very realistic eyes, a very realistic lens they're using. And when they look, for example, at ancient Greece, <laughs> in many ways, the, the democratic experiment of Greece, which of course failed in the end, it, it collapsed into chaos, into tyranny, uh, the, the city-states in, in Greece, they're taking away from that uh, immensely important lessons. What does it mean to have a self-governing republic, uh, polity, political society at the end of the day? So they're learning the warning lessons from Greece and also from Rome in various ways. How did Rome go from a, a republic with a Senate and something like a separation of powers? How did it transform itself into an empire and then collapse itself into tyranny? And so the Americans, like no other political generation, are mining the lessons from the ancient world. Um, and to borrow a, a phrase from my good friend Oz Guinness, they are studying history in order to defy history, meaning they knew the great challenges they faced in trying to create and sustain a democratic republic. What they were attempting had never been tried before over a vast expanse, a nation that was going to be built not on the basis of race or on some religious creed uh, or based on geography, ethnicity. It was going to be based on a set of ideas, a set of propositions, a, a political creed. That was a new thing, a new idea in the history of ideas. And that's where Os Guinness is so good on this. The political society is toward decay, degeneration, decay, and collapse. That's the natural drift. That's kind of the bad news. We'll get into the good news. But the, the founders were so attentive to that, to those patterns of history. Uh, and they wanted to break the pattern in the constitution that they gave us, in the principles that they gave us. And they did look to the ancient Greeks and to the ancient Romans for some wisdom there. I'll just mention a little bit more before we may just get into discussion. One of their the, the models for them would be the statesman Cicero, uh, considered Rome's probably his great their, their greatest orator, uh, and certainly one of their greatest statesmen. And if you think about uh, Cicero and his career, he is, and there are a few others as well, but he's the one guy who's trying to stand against the tide of tyranny. This is the guy who's going to the floor of the Senate and delivering speeches warning about how Rome has been squandering its great Republican inheritance. And I think Cicero was kind of the man for the hour, actually. I'm, do, I'm working on a, on a new lecture series I'd like to develop called Cicero and the City because I think this is the man for the hour. Let me just read you a few lines from, from Cicero uh, from the Republic. And that'll key us up, I think, for our discussion. Long before living memory, he says, our ancestral way of life produced outstanding men. And those excellent men preserved the old way of life in the institutions of their forefathers. 
our generation, however, he says, our generation, after inheriting our political organization like a magnificent picture now fading with age, not only neglected to restore its original colors, but did not even bother to ensure that it retained its basic form, its faintest outlines. And he goes on of this great tragedy. We are not only bound to give a description, we must somehow defend ourselves as if we were arraigned on a capital charge. He puts Rome in the dock. He puts its political leadership on trial. And it seems to me we're at something like a, a kind of Cicero moment. We need more organizations like yours. We need more men and women of character, of education, intelligence, virtue, who can stand in the gap and say, we are not gonna let this American Republic go, go the way of Rome. We're not gonna let it happen, but it's gonna take an engaged citizenry to do it. So I'm so grateful for the work of Constituting America, grateful for your, your panel here, your all-star panel of Jordan and Jewel. Can't wait to get into a discussion with them. So let's throw it over for discussion whenever you're ready. Well, thank you, Dr. Lacante. That was such a great opening and, and really set the stage for our discussion today. And I want to go first to our founder, the actress Janine Turner, who's with us today. And Janine, I know you've got some great questions lined up. I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, yes. I Applause, applause, applause for that wonderful opening. I, I love your enthusiasm. And this is right up my alley. Uh, we had a 90-day study last year which was this exactly, American Exceptionalism Revealed. And we walked through you know, Greece, Rome, Venice Republic, all the way down through, uh, you're familiar with this, I'm sure, all the, all the way down through um, uh, Stalin, Mao, Hitler, yeah. you know, Napoleon, Louis XIV, wow. how we haven't fallen into these traps because of our founding documents. That's what makes, makes us exceptional. exceptional. The, what was declared in the, in the Declaration of Independence and how the Constitution protects those rights with the checks and balances. And, um, you know, it was yes. interesting. We, we had an essayist, yes. we're talking about the first principles um, that just talked about even the, the influence, you know, I don't know, it's a tricky thing today, but Reverend Hooker and Reverend Wise were actually talking about these things before John Locke had ever even written about it. They were uh, pastors here in, in America. I thought that was really interesting. I, I did not know that. Um, so anywho, you what you're saying is great but they're in broad strokes and i find that you know with our students and whatnot can, can you let's let's kind of just and, and i want to make sure everybody else has time so but let's talk about five principles and i you know i have to answer quickly because i can't hog all the time and everybody else has to speak but five principles that were what are these classic principles that are so important and what are we not doing today that's creating the danger yeah. um, because in other words, what did Rome, you know, Rome, the, I think then the democracy of Greece, they, it just became too corrupt when you had these, these officials that were speaking to the crowds and in the, in the, you know, in the masses, but they started not, I don't know, the democracy didn't work. The Republic didn't work because it, it fell into uh, Caesar and military. So it kind of yin and yang it for us a little bit. Specifically, <laughs> specifically with specifics. Like if you were to give us five principles in the classical American history that that they wanted to make sure that we had, and then what are we doing uh, wrong today? Yeah, yeah, that's a tremendous question, Janine. It's a huge question. Uh, whether we can boil it down to five or 15 or I don't know how many, but let me throw out a few to get us thinking. The idea that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, it's a cliche, of course, but we don't take it seriously enough. The founders took it deadly seriously. And so the, one of the great challenges was, okay, you've got to balance individual freedom. You've got to have individual freedom, but you also have to have order. And so this principle of balancing freedom with order, it was a huge challenge. This is where you could argue the Greeks really failed and the Romans really failed. Um, you have to design a constitution that respects human nature in all of its fullness, meaning, yes, men and women were capable of great acts of virtue and sacrifice and heroism and all that, but there's a dark side to human nature. We got to take it seriously. The will to power, the desire to dominate and control others. So how do you boil that down to a principle? Well, um, 
you let's let's have a constitutional principle the separation of powers that would be one print you got to deal with human nature as you find you got to somehow maintain freedom but also order a constitutional system has to have as a feature it has to have a separation of powers legislative branch judicial executive branch and they have discrete roles and responsibilities you guys have talked about that i know many many times but it's worth repeating as a principle let me throw another principle out there it's great to have a, a constitution and the ones that the founders gave us is absolutely remarkable. You also have to have as a principle, let's call it civic virtue, civic virtue. So yes, there's there's a sense of, of your own private character, what you are in the dark, but it's also this concern for the larger good, the common good. That's what I think the founders meant and the, the classical thinkers, uh, Greece and Rome especially, civic virtue or pietas, that's the word that uh, Virgil uses to describe Aeneas in the Aeneid, which was a work that the American founders knew and loved and adored. Uh, George Washington, for example, had a, he had a statue on his desk of, uh, of Aeneas carrying his father out from the flaming wreckage of Troy. These guys studied these classical authors. So the idea of virtue, civic virtue, your willingness to sacrifice your own personal interests for the common good, for the greater good. And if you think about it, that virtue was really on display, uh, at, particularly at the Constitutional Convention when all these, all these compromises have to be made. Civic virtue, we can't let the whole thing go to the dogs. We gotta give and take and compromise. So let's put civic virtue on there. I wanna put one more principle and then throw it over for discussion again. You have to have this belief in a fundamental universal law, moral law that governs the universe. Cicero called it natural law. Uh, John Locke would pick up that idea of natural law and natural rights. And then the American founders, of course, what the Declaration of Independence is in many ways, it is a natural law, natural rights document. There's a moral law set of laws governing the universe, given to us by God, that our conscience can understand, self-evident truths. You have to have that fundamental belief in the natural law, in the moral law, because that will help constrain vice and inspire virtue. And it's one of the things that Cicero was calling out the Romans uh, on uh, in their own corruption. The American founders depended on this idea of natural law to who undergird the Republic. So I put those three things on the table, Janine, for a start. What do you think? Well, well, well said. You're terrific, <laughs> by the way. Um, well, well said. It, it reminds me of, because uh, I was thinking about corruption, and this is, I'm paraphrasing, and we've talked about this a lot here, but George Washington's farewell address when he said the demise of America would be the party system, the faction. Yeah. Because people will care more about their party than about yeah. being an American. And I, if ever that has been yes. magnified or existed in our country more, I, I mean, it's, it's now where it, no one wants to get at the truth. Yes. They just want their party to win. That's right. Um, and That's we're, right. we're seeing this, we're seeing this uh, left and right. It, it, it's yes. just... And if we can't get down to the truth about corruption and we're yes. going to sweep all the corruption under the carpet because we just yes. want our party to win, this, I think, is our biggest danger um, yes. because this is when dictators come in where people just don't care. And, and my last question to you will be, yes. um, you, you spoke a, a, a nice, a short amount of time, so I have a little more time, but the... I just lost my train of thought now, but, but it's, it's the, um, it's what Cicero was saying was about the corruption of power. So how do yeah. you think we fix this? Yeah. How, you know, yeah. part of the, part of it goes hand in hand with me, patriotism going down everybody, you know, from, yes. you know, 78% to 38% in, you know, a generation, if people don't love their country. And I think another thing might be that people are more concerned about just what the government can do for them instead of what they can do for their yeah. government. I, I mean, yeah. it goes back to Kennedy's words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Janine, I'm so glad you put this on the table, the idea of uh, the lack of, an, of our concern for the common good, rank partisanship, the willingness to, to embrace all kinds of nonsense and lies. We're awash in lies and it's a bipartisan problem. And I so appreciate you bringing it to the table because this is what sister 
identified as the enemy within. And I think this is part of what Lincoln warned about in the Lyceum Address, the corruption from within. If we walk away from the truth, if we walk away from virtue as people of faith, particularly if a person of faith, and I am a person of Christian faith, if we walk away from that as a country, never mind as a single party, but as a country, the last person out the door, <laughs> turn off the lights because we're done here, right? So the, the commitment to truth and to virtue uh, above uh, any kind of partisan gain or advantage. I mean, this is why our founders are such wonderful examples. When, when Washington is offered several times, and you guys know well know the story, they want to make him king, and he keeps telling them no. He resigns his military com commission willingly and obediently before an elected body. It's, an, it's a remarkable thing that he does to set an example. That's putting uh, the commitment to truth and virtue above your own personal ambition or party interest. <laughs> the only way to recover that, Janine, I think, at least one of the ways, is yes, what you guys are doing right here, but I want to say at a broader level, we have to have more academic institutions. You would expect me to say this as an educator. We've got to have more colleges, uh, classical Christian colleges, conservative colleges that are devoted to teaching, to inculcating these, these ideas in the next generation. If we vacate that space, then I see no hope for this republic. We cannot vacate that space. So thank you for raising that point, Janine. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna pass now. And I'll just say, you know, it's, uh, we have a lot of, as a nation of free, uh, freedom of religion, there are a lot of religions, uh, different religions that, that embody virtue. So I would say yes. it's, it's, the, it's the Christian realism, but it's, it's sort of any faith, that where someone realizes there's a higher purpose than themselves, yeah, that there's right. a higher purpose to serve a God. That's I think right. whatever re whatever religion that's wraps right. re wraps their wings around that, I think is is really great. Well, okay, I'm going to pass. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'm enjoying where we are so far, and I want to draw a little uh, a little parallel. When Jewel and I were in college, uh, we studied scenic design for theater. And any, any designer that has worked their salt, they will start every time in with Rome, with classical, you know, you'll move into flying buttresses. You learn all of this so in-depthly. And there is a reason for it. Um, and it's interesting to look at that art in that time, we look back at that time and it is, I would say objectively beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot really argue that the famous designers of that era, that there's anything <laughs> ugly. <laughs> We've moved to modern art to where it is subjective. Uh, there can be arguments for days, you know, some, some artists will argue for days on who's better than who and because it is very subjective, because you're looking at such modern uh, depictions in the art. Now I'd say that our founders took what they could find, took from the classical era, the objective truths that the, truths that they could find and tried to make an objectively true document. But we are now sort of in this modern art place where we are trying to make a subjective to trying to form a subjective constitution to ourselves are you following me yeah yeah like i think so to, i'll just like you to dissect that a little bit for me yeah uh that's a fascinating uh, couple of questions you put, put out there john i mean and i'm really glad you guys are representing this from the maybe the more artistic uh side and this is not my specialty as an intellectual historian, but it is absolutely true that the founders, Jefferson in particular, right, when he designs the city that I'm, I'm in right now, I'm in Washington, D.C., his whole idea for designing the city was to cram as much of that classical architecture, you know, into this city. And it has made for, it's a lovely town. D.C. has its problems, as you know, uh, a skyrocketing crime problem and rats all over the place. But here we are in the swamp. But it is a, there is a lovely aspect to the architecture of this of this town, no question about it. I've traveled uh, in Europe. I've traveled a good deal to Italy. Got a family Italian background, uh, so I can appreciate that architecture. And there are probably different reasons. I'm sure there are different reasons they were drawn to that architecture. 
It seems to me that one of the reasons, John, is what you just suggested. They, they believed objectively in beauty, that there was a kind of truth in beauty, whether that it, it could be represented in music, the arts and architecture, there was an objective truth about it. There was something right about it in the way that it would stir our moral imagination, stir our hearts to things that are noble, right? That's what great art, great architecture, great literature will do. It stirs up the best in us, the, the noblest aspirations, the sense of longing. Um, and I think the founders were aware of this because of their own religious sensibilities. There's truth in beauty and architecture can be beautiful or not. <laughs> Plenty of the latter. And we long for the former. You know, a quick practical example. Uh, I travel a lot into New York because I'm a native New Yorker and I, I traveled to New York to teach at the King's College there from DC, taking the Amtrak train in. And, you know, for years and years, since the 1960s, when they demolished the original Penn Station and they built this monstrosity Penn Station, uh, just it's like crawling like rats in a sewer entering Penn Station in New York City. They have finally, it's still there, but they, they finally built a new train station uh, that welcomes people into New York in a much more appropriate, visually, aesthetically appro appropriate way, the Moynihan uh, Center over there. It's, a, it's a, lots of marble, lots of light, it's a pretty well done piece of architecture and you just feel completely differently when you enter into that space than when you enter into the old Penn Station rat infested little you know, sewer of a train station that New York in its, in its uh, infinite wisdom gave us, right? So they crawled back from that because they realized how soul destroying it is. So back to the point, I'm wandering a bit, but I love the point you made though uh, here, uh, Jordan, about the founders recognizing there is a truth in beauty. They want as much of that as possible to be represented in the nation's capital. And that is worth thinking about. What do you think? I like it. I, just, <laughs> I think you actually rounded that out very well. Uh, and, you know, that's really why I posed the question, because I wanted to see, you know, your thoughts on such a uh, such an occasion. Do you want to ask? Me yeah. To so going? we last week we started talk. We've in this series, we've talked about the principles in the Declaration we talked about providence and today we've talked about these uh, some more of these foundational ideals um these ideas are core to what it means to be american and they're core to why our constitution has worked but these ideals are some of what we've already talked yeah. about are rarely actually discussed they're attacked uh almost not explicitly more implicitly and kind of undermined in in education and in politics but some yes. some simple things like you you said the, the cliche of uh power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely it's kind of big idea and it's a statement on human nature and our in our government yes was writ has has founding documents recognizing that as a truth of its founding yes but today we don't have that same discussion again we don't teach on the fact that this is a truth that you are free to practice any religion you believe, but yes. secular secularism is not really a devoid of of a, of a belief. It is it's a belief in and of itself. So my first, so my question is kind of with that background. How do you think we start to have those conversations more so? And you being someone who teaches, you, you probably do this all the time. Well, thank you for that question, Joel. It's a terrific question. How do we steer conversations? I do think we need to uh, draw from examples of everyday life to remind people, and this point is really worth making, uh, as much as we, as the founders revered these, uh, the classical uh, tradition, the Greeks and the Romans, they also were beneficiaries of the impact of Christianity on the West and the way in which the Christian church, the Christian gospel, in a sense, baptized or transformed the Greco-Roman world and in real ways, civilized it. Civilized it in ways it had not experienced. So what do I mean? Um, you know, even Aristotle, for all his genius, he imagined this kind of a society, political society based on slavery. They could not have imagined, the, the ancients, a political society based on the idea of human equality 
and the infinite worth of every human being, equal justice under the law for all people, regardless of their religious beliefs, regardless of their social status, equal justice under the law. Those are Christian ideas. Those ideas grew out of the Jewish Christian tradition because of the infinite worth, the amazing worth of every individual in the sight of God. That's what the Christian gospel did to the West and how it transformed the classical Christian tradition. So I think we need to have conversations that remind people of that. And I'll give you just, um, I'll give you a couple of examples, kind of personal examples, one personal, one more out there in the world of sports, which I think you guys might appreciate. The personal example, I was in the, the, the lovely little island of Vendor then where my grandfather was born, my Italian grandfather, Giuseppe Aiello, for whom I named. And uh, I'm there in Vento Den, and in Vento Den, and in the, in the afternoon uh, until about midnight, the little children just take over the piazza. They just take it over. They're playing, they're playing soccer, they're playing with their dolls, uh, they're playing hide and seek. And I'm watching a little group of them. And uh, there's a little boy in that group who has some kind of a, uh, a limp, something like a deformity with his leg, but he's hobbling along along with the group, and you hear the, the children in that group say, Eduardo, Eduardo, vieni qua, vieni qua, andiamo. Eduardo is part of the group. He's included. He's included. He's not left out. If he had been born in ancient Greece or in ancient Rome, he would have been excluded, right? He wouldn't have counted. That's the civilizing influence of Christianity in our culture, in our civilization. And we just completely take it for granted that everyone is welcome, everyone is brought inside, right? Example from sports here, gentlemen. Uh, I don't know if you what, what baseball fans, what team you follow. I'm a New Yorker, so I follow the New York Mets, the hapless New York Mets. It's a hopeless task. Um, but a couple of years ago, I remember watching this live, so it was an amazing game. Uh, Kevin Pilar, who was then the outfielder for the Mets, He's facing the uh, Atlanta Braves pitcher who's throwing a, a fastball of about 95 miles an hour, hits him in the face, blood everywhere, gruesome scene. He's okay, but he's out on the ground. They got to pull him out of the game. He's in, uh, he's in surgery. He's out for a while. He comes back to the Mets and he's coming back now to play the Atlanta Braves and to face that same pitcher again for the first time. So all the talk in baseball is <laughs> what is that posture going to be? What's the, what's, What's the body language going to be like? What's Pilar in that picture? What's that going to be like? What kind of confrontation are we going to see here? He got hit in the face with a baseball. And you watch what happens. And Kevin Pilar gets up to the plate, looks at, looks at the picture for the Atlanta Braves, tips his hat, and he nods. And then the pitcher for the Atlanta Braves looks at Kevin Pilar, tips his hat, and he nods. There's no blood feud. There's no tribalism. There's no vengeance. The past is the past. We have a job to do, and that job is baseball. <laughs> and we take it for granted that that's what happens in sports events like that. That's the civilizing influence, I would argue, of the Christian gospel on our civilization, on that Greco-Roman civilization. So I think we got to do a better job of telling stories about how those principles that we take for granted, equality, inclusion, forgiveness, justice, they come from somewhere. Yes, there's an ancient classical um, source for those things, but it only gave us the beginnings of it, only the beginnings of the idea of justice or equality or government by consent, only the beginnings. Christianity then begins to transform those ideas and I think culminates in an amazing way in the American experiment, not that it was ever perfect, not that they ever thought it could be, but they thought they could achieve a more just, and stable and prosperous and humane society based on these principles. And I think they were right. So the part of the answer now is not to abandon those principles as some on the left and frankly, some on the right seem willing to do. We got to engage, re-educate like you guys are trying to do. So appreciate both of you. Yeah, that, uh, what an uplifting story and a wonderful way of being able to talk about those principles in action and seeing them and making it more meaningful to us and our listeners to understand really what we're talking about, not theoretically, but experientially. Um, now, since that was so uplifting, I want to say something uh, possibly more negative, uh, <laughs> which is that 
as we've talked about this, this question has, has come back to my mind for these past three weeks, which is that you just mentioned something about our rights and how our founders, whether you want, whether we make claims of, of their personal beliefs of being um, deists or whatever that people want to claim, which we are actually, you know, when we look at original documents, we don't see these claims as always being true, but they are often taught in um, higher education. Um, that our founders believe that those rights came from God, came from creator, and that because of that, the rights couldn't be taken away, and that the government was there to protect the rights, and that we needed government because we were flawed. And if we weren't flawed, we wouldn't necessarily need government, but government was like a necessary evil. So we have these, these big ideas which are based on a belief in a God and rights, but if we are not basing our rights in that, then the, there actually has to be a discussion on where those rights are being based. And that discussion can't really be had because if you go to school, that what we just said is never said. You go through 12 years and unless you go to a, a unless you have a phenomenal teacher who watches Constituting America constitutional chats and takes parts in, in all of the wonderful things Constituting America does, there's a good yeah. chance that, that a kid never hears it. And so there's a bit of me that's kind of pessimistic then because because mm -hmm. what we're talking about is very foreign. So we're, so um, do you, I, so the, then the question is, is the fight really that we need to fix that part of education? That when we let, that when we let this hyper um, secularism into schools, we've also divorced our schools of their bearings of reason. And yes. being able to give real meaning from yes. kids because you have freedom to practice any religion here, yes. but it wasn't freedom from any religion. Yes, here. yes. Splendid question, Joel. Again, another deep question. I, can't you guys ask me a yes or no question over there uh, before we done it? <laughs> You're too good at answering them. The last one I got two great stories about a, a courtyard and a baseball game. <laughs> Hey, may I just interject something for two seconds? I, I'm only and taking yes and no questions from here on in. Oh, please. Uh, uh, well, I just would like to interject that this is going to sound very strange that New York is actually doing something along these lines that might be good that Jewel and Jordan y'all are talking about. Um, New York just passed and, you know, I saw this run by my face in a news thing. I haven't read about it in depth. Um, that in the schools, they have to have a moment of meditation. Um, and this may get a lot of criticism, but I think it's a start because I've been talking about this for a long time. You know, why don't we, I had this idea, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago, they have us on a news station talking about it. Why don't we have like a 10 minute, five minute meditational time and, and students can, can pray to any, to whatever their God is in their own religion. Um, so we're not forcing a specific God, but then they had this, this moment of meditation. And uh, I don't know how they're doing it in New York. And I, it's probably just a moment to breathe deeply and things of that nature. But instead of making light of it, I, I think it's sort of a start. If we could just get some focus yeah. in these schools, I know a lot of the charter schools are having um, these classical schools do have moments where they start their day talking about character. Um, mm. And uh, so, you know, this is how we change America when we, the people, have ideas like this, but we're willing to germinate them and yes. water them and take them all the way to fruition. That's how that's how these yes. changes are made. And I don't. I think that maybe yes. there's a little bit of encouragement there because we we're talking about we don't have it in our schools, but how could we start to have it in our schools? Yes. Because it is true. Once we took any type of God out of school, then students don't know that in phones, take the phones out of their classroom. But anyway, I just like this idea of a moment of meditation. I think we can build upon it. Jorn, what do you think, Jewel and Jorn? Yeah. What do y'all think about that? It's kind of a start, isn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, it's something. I, I guess part of the concern though, um, and where the question is, is still that there's no why. So you go, if, if you don't, there's really no, at the base our, in our education system, you never get to a why. And yeah. our country really started with a whole lot of really yeah. strong, rock solid yeah. whys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, 
really appreciate that point, Janine. It's great to create just a little bit of space for people to pause for a moment and maybe reflect on one of the, the, the larger questions about purpose and meaning and significance. I think that's a terrific thing to do. You know, this idea of how do we have these kinds of conversations and help people to understand the great debt that we owe to religious belief, to freedom of religion, to freedom of conscience, to the idea of God. Um, I think there are different ways to go about this. Um, rabbi Sachs, he was the chief rabbi of Great Britain until he passed away several years ago. Rabbi Sachs, uh, he said that the self-evident truths of the Declaration of Independence are anything but self-evident. And then he went on. They would have been unintelligible to Plato, Aristotle, or to every hierarchical society the world has ever known. They are self-evident only, he said, to people, to Jews and Christians who have internalized the Hebrew Bible. That's coming from a Jewish thinker. Self-evident truths root rooted in this idea, this Jewish Christian idea of being made in the image of God. Now, we're not there now anymore. I understand that in our national system. However, here's the good news, guys <laughs> and ladies. The good news is you can't fairly accurately teach so much of our history unless you are introducing people to, to the influence of the Bible in our society, in our civilization. Let's just take one obvious example uh, and we're going to be reflecting on this pretty soon, I think, the 60-year anniversary of uh, uh, Martin Luther King's uh, uh, March on Washington. You cannot explain the career and the success of the civil rights movement led by the Reverend Martin Luther King without understanding this deep commitment to Christian principle, a movement that was born. So, you can't be intellectually honest, it seems to me, and teach so much of our history without reminding people of the constructive influence of the scriptures, the Jewish and Christian scriptures. Janine, what do you think? You want to take a stab at that? Well, what it reminds me of is we had a, um, I don't know where I heard this, it was a guest uh, on something for Constitution America, but that, um, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were they are the conscience. That was the conscience of America. Um, yeah. And it was from that platform and yes. foundation that we we were to build upon that and become better and better and better and more enlightened people. But it, yes. it still serves to be our conscience. And I, I just love that. Uh, who was that, Kathy, that was on our show and talked about that? That was uh, our professor, Adam Carrington from Hills. That's from right. Yeah, yeah. The conscience, the conscience of America. And, and right. So it was just, you know, it, it's like it's like a parent saying, this is how you should live your life, but the parent doesn't always do it well, you know, but the seed is still planted. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I mean, um, well, I just, I want to jump in because uh, Tova's sorry, on. sorry, Kathy, go ahead. Sure that we get to, to some of Tova's questions, if that's okay. Oh, yeah. Everyone, thanks for having me on. Apologies we for uh, being late. <laughs> we love hearing from Tova, of course. Hi, Tova. I am literally at the airport right now, but you know me, I would never, never miss one of these. So happy to uh, get to participate. Um, I just caught a bit of the conversation you were having about religious values in the U.S. And I was just curious, um, I've you know, heard the phrase uh, like Judeo-Christian values used quite a lot both with you and with other guests, I was curious if we could break down particularly what you mean by that and what sort of values you're referring to when you mention that. Um, yes. I'm just thinking, um, especially in contrast to, like, like, what are the systems you're contrasting with? For instance, like, I, I'm Jewish, so I'm thinking about it from that side. And I know yes. there were a lot of societies where, like, Judaism interacted with Islam or with other religions. Um, and so is saying yes. Judeo-Christian contrasting it from from that tradition and you know how are those values relevant in a society now that's you know extremely pluralistic yes. with regards to religion and culture so that's a big one but yeah. <laughs> go for it <laughs> thank you tova and good to meet you and you're you're off to italy it sounds like yeah oh yes <laughs> okay. i need going to italy 
Terrific. Well, we won't keep you, we won't uh, delay your departure, but uh, thank you for that question. It's a terrific question. Um, uh, as I've studied the history of the West and, of course, um, uh, the, the trajectory of the Jewish people uh, and then the relationship to Christianity, um, some of the things that they share, that these two great religions share, of course, is the idea of a rational God, a purposeful God who has moral purposes for mankind. This is, to me, one of the great gifts of the Jews, to give us the Ten Commandments, these moral commandments, these universal moral laws not from nowhere, not from uh, the, the, the depths of the sea, <laughs> but from the hand of God, from the voice of God. So the idea of a rational, purposeful creator, separate from his creation, distinct from his creation, uh, who gives us a moral code and has a moral mission for mankind. The Jewish uh, community gave, it seems to me, gave the Western world that, that concept. And the Christian community very much picked up on it. Both communities, of course, also share this, I, I think, really unique view of the special dignity of the human being. Men and women, male and female, made in, in his image in some mysterious way. And so possessing these, these qualities or capacities that we associate with the divine, with providence of rationality, purposefulness, creativity. Right? That's it. I'm not saying other religious systems don't have something like that, but it is it is distinctive in the Jewish and Christian faiths and really deeply shared. I'll throw out one more, Tova, and then we want to hear from you. I think there's a universalism in both faiths, because think about the promise to Abraham uh, in Genesis. The promise to Abraham is, through you, Abraham, all nations of the world will be blessed. The blessing to Abraham and to the Jewish people was to be extended to the, to the ends of the earth. That's part of the Jewish tradition, as I understand it. All nations will be blessed through you, Abraham, in Genesis 12 and 15. Those are hinges in the Bible, it seems to me. Well, the Christians pick up this idea of universalism, that the message of God's grace, his forgiveness, inclusion, it's for everyone. Everyone will be invited into the final banquet. And it seems to me that universalism, uh, that both religious uh, traditions share has profoundly influenced our own political culture. But I want to throw it over back to you, Tola, for some response. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that was a, a really interesting explanation. I think that provided a lot of clarity to a term that is used a lot. I mean, I, I can speak more to my own religion, but I think those are um, definitely accurate classifications of beliefs that are pretty central. Um, I, I guess I would be curious um, not not to delve into now, but I just think it would be interesting to study um, like different religious traditions and, you know, whether they've also had those beliefs, because I think it's a bit easier to say that a certain belief is present in one religion than to say yeah. that it is present in one religion while not being present in another. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's definitely an interesting point. Um, and then just uh, going down like a totally different track, discussing uh, classical values um you know in the constitution I, I was curious um if there were any ancient uh military tactics or battles that um during the revolutionary war or american wars they kind of used for inspiration or or wisdom wow. um, i know we've talked a lot about the texts but that's one aspect i think we haven't talked as much about so i'm curious well, wow, that is a terrific question. And if I was a military historian, I could give you a very informed answer. I'll say a couple of things. <laughs> uh, in that, I think not less the battles, but but, but the, the 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 various figures who demonstrated restraint in the context of a military situation or a conflict. So, for example, you know, George Washington, one of his well, one of the people he emulated uh, was Cato. Another was Cincinnati, and these are these are Roman statesmen and their soldiers as well, uh, who know un, who understand what virtue is and how to restrain themselves when they're tempted to absolute power. So there were models that were inspirational to the founders. There there is a a, a battle though that, that has echoes uh, in the American Civil War, and that's the three hundred at Sparta, defending the 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 democratic state of Sparta against the Persians and the last 300 who perish, trying to make a desperate stand to buy time for the Greeks. And I think you could say there's an echo of that at uh, Little Round Top in, in the Civil War. Chamberlain's 300, he has roughly 300 men in his command 
as he orders them when they have no more ammunition left than their rifles. Their rifles are empty and he orders them to go into the teeth of the Confederate army without any ammunition, with their bayonets attached, and they do. They follow his orders, they go down Little Round Top, they rout the Confederate army, and it's a turning point uh, in, in the Civil War, really, Gettysburg. And I think Chamberlain, because he was grounded in the classical Christian tradition, I suspect he was mindful of the example of the 300 at Sparta. What do you think? Yeah, that, that was a, a very interesting explanation. Um, it, it's always fascinating to hear um, that looking back on classical times isn't just sort of a way to get, you know, wishy-washy inspiration for our values, but it can also be like a very practical source of like real building blocks for our yes. strategy in society. So that, that was really interesting to hear. I'm curious, um, are there any uh, misconceptions or oversimplifications about classical history that you feel like should be addressed um, if we're to gain a more nuanced or complete or accurate view uh, when implementing that in, you know, those values into our society? Yes. Excellent. Excellent question, Tova. I'm glad you asked a very informed question. What are the misconceptions? Let me, let me take a stab at that. I haven't thought enough about this. I got to be honest, uh, in part because I'm a modern historian who focuses on kind of the, the Renaissance Reformation to the present. Not so much of a focus on classical, but I I think there are misconceptions maybe uh, on kind of the left and the right with regard to ancient Rome. We don't want to romanticize uh, ancient Rome and its Republican uh, system of government, right? Yeah, there's a, there's a kind of a separation of powers going on. But you know, <laughs> when, when Cicero has to kind of stand in the gap there uh, in the first century before Christ, uh, what's going on in Rome with its great Republican institutions? Well, they really are in decay. There are economic disparities. Um, there is a, a tax system that's oppressive. There is a massive public work system uh, that it, it doesn't have good financing, <laughs> adequate financing. Crime is rampant. Um, and uh, in Rome, a, a population of about a million people, everybody's complaining about the traffic. So, you know, some things never change. Some of this stuff does sound very familiar, though, too, in terms of where America is as, as a republic with some of the struggles we have, the disparities, the inequalities, remembering that Rome was built on, on the backs of slaves. And I think that they sometimes may be a, a, a tendency on the, the, those on the right, maybe on the political right, to look at Rome, the Republican system, Cicero, uh, et cetera, and not realize or not pay enough attention to the fact that <laughs> Roman society was brutal. And if you are not in the inner ring of the inner ring, life was very difficult for you. And of course, if you were a slave, you were just a commodity who could be dispensed with instantly. So we don't want to romanticize that. But on the other, on the other end, another misconception, I think that there are many on the, on the political left, the cultural left, who aren't sufficiently aware of what Rome actually achieved. And that these Roman statesmen, like Cicero, because of his commitment to natural law, universal moral law. I mean, this really was an important idea in Rome, that you couldn't, in theory, just do anything you wanted. That's why the, the arrival of the Caesars was so horrifying to so many people in Rome. They didn't think of themselves that way. They thought of themselves as a civilizing force in the world. And there's something to be said for that, because outside of Rome's borders, its system of, ro of roads, its, its, its system of laws, life could be really, to quote from Hobbes, nasty, brutish, and short. So there were some achievements there in ancient Rome, but also, of course, incredible disparities and injustices at the same time, if that helps. Yes, well, thank you so much for answering all of my questions. I feel like these constitutional chats always happen to be perfectly timed in my life. Like we <laughs> studied, we did one on the government of Iran while I was taking my final on the government of Iran. We did the Federalist Papers while I was studying that in high school. And now we're doing classical history as I'm carting off to Rome. Um, so uh, <laughs> thank you so much for being with us today. And I'll, I'll turn over to Kathy for some audience questions. All right. Arrivederci. Arrivederci, Tova. Arrivederci. 
Thank you, Tova, Jill and Jordan and Janine for all your great questions. I wanna take a moment to recognize uh, so many students that we have with us today. We have Fred Dursley with uh, students from the Mansfield Classical Academy who are watching. We have uh, Hannah Hansen, uh, Classical Homeschool with students watching today. Lisa Paget with a homeschool uh, with students watching today. Lizette Flores, Grace and Faith Academy, students watching today. Serena Ashcroft with the Ancora Academy, students watching today. And Rain, uh, Wayne McCurdy with High Country Home Educators and has students watching. So welcome to all the students who are with us. If I didn't mention you, please uh, type your name in the Q&A and we'll try to give you a shout out before we sign off today. But Dr. LeConte, uh, we have one of your possibly former students, or at least her dad was a professor at King's College, maybe with you, uh, who wrote Kristen Tokarov, who's also one of our former contest winners, says, glad to see Joe LeConte. I remember him from my time my dad was teaching at the King's College. So we want to give Kristen a shout out as well. Right. Now, um, Ron Meyer asks, since the late 19th century, almost no one has studied the classics in K-12 or even college, with the emphasis instead being on STEM and preparation for the world of work. How can our educational system be reinvigorated to teach the classics? That is an excellent question. That's an excellent question, which one I need to give more attention to. I want to put it in the broader context of the classics as part of the humanities, the humanities, right? The philosophy, economics, politics, the arts, religion, and the, and the classics being part of the humanities. That's the kind of core, academic core, uh, that was true over there, uh, has been true at King's College. I was a visiting professor also at Grove City College. I'm going to give a shout out to Grove City, uh, where the humanity's core is, is still very much important, grounded in this, in this biblical understanding of human nature uh, and, and that. But um, how do we do that? You know, if you think about um, the most difficult and important questions we can ask ourselves, is there a God? What's the purpose, significance of our lives? The nature of political society, the nature of virtue, the good life. The most uh, important questions we can ask, those questions are addressed and debated within the humanities, certainly within that classical tradition. Aristotle, Socrates, right? Plato, they're, they're pondering the tough questions. Um, Here's an argument you can make that by not addressing those questions and giving students uh, the best resources that the West has to offer, the, the classics and the humanities more broadly, not only have we asked those questions as a civilization, we provided pretty good answers. And I think the best answers that humanity has to those questions are found in, in the humanities, in the humanities, partly in that classical tradition, but then also baptized, if you will, by the Jewish and Christian faiths as well. So by depriving young people of, of those resources, of those intellectual, moral, even spiritual resources, I think we're not only doing them a great disservice, we're cutting them off from their great, this great inheritance. And I think that's probably contributing to some of the emotional struggles and difficulties that a, young, a lot of young people have in college. It all seems to be up for grabs. Redefine yourself in any way, way you like. There's no truth out there at all. And, I, th and that is so disorienting when what we've learned as a civilization is, wait a minute, there are some anchors. We've, we've gone down some roads. We've learned some things. Let's recover some of those truths now. I love that line from Socrates. You know, when he's asked, uh, basically uh, warned, threatened with that democratic jury in Athens, Socrates has said, look, stop, stop uh, corrupting the youth of Athens uh, with all of your questions, your Socratic method and your questioning. Stop it or basically we're going to kill you. And he has the choice, exile or drink the hemlock, drink the poison. And, you know, we all know what he does. He chooses the poison. And what, what Socrates said uh, 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 there is that he turns the table on his accusers. And the love of truth is the thing that he's after. The love of truth, the belief in truth, and the willingness to, to die to pursue the truth, because it matters if there are truths to be known, what we do as human beings in response to those truths is not only going to affect our lives in this life, 
But if you have a faith perspective, how we respond to those truths can have an influence ripple into eternity. That's worth thinking about, right? Well, thank you so much. And we are right at the top of the hour. And so we want to thank all of our audience for joining us today. And Janine uh, or Jewel, Jorn, Tova, any parting words before we go? Just a terrific show. Thank you, Dr. Laconte. I mean, wonderful. Really, really terrific. Uh, Great thing to do. <laughs> a lot, lot of thought provoke, uh, you know, a lot of specific answers and and ideas about how to really put this into action. So thank you very much. And everyone, Jewel and Jorn and Jacob and Tova and Kathy. So and our and our wonderful listening audience. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. Have a great day. Thank you, Tova. And we want to invite everybody to join us next week, Tuesday at 2 p.m. We're going to be talking about the principle of constitutional restraint. So thank you, and we'll see you next week. And thank you, Dr. Laconte. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. Can't have too much constitutional restraint. I'm all for that. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.